I'm still safe. What's the most important thing you have to work with? What's your stock in trade? Your mind? No, not your mind. Your patient's mind. That's what you're working with. The patient's mind. And the most important thing that you're going to utilize in your sessions is your patient's thought process. That's all. You have to get them to think. Why? Because everything that you and I do and everything that a patient ever does in lifetime is preceded by a thought. We don't do a darn thing in our lifetime until first we think about it. And there's no emotions and feelings or symptoms unless first it's preceded by a thought. So what you're going to do, and you're going to learn how, is to change what they think about, then you can change your conduct. Since everything is preceded by a thought, what you have to do is change your thinking. Change the thought. If a person comes to you and says, I got a problem, first thing you're going to think about, I wonder what caused their problem. What did they think about? What did they hear? What's in their head? Because that's what you have to change. You change how they think, and you'll change how they act or how they feel. So I don't care if there's any trust, rapport, confidence, make a difference. Your only thing you had to work with is that person's thought process. Number one, write your definition of hypnosis. Tell me, when a person's in a state of hypnosis, are they aware of what's going on? Yes. yes. Are they? Yes. Anybody here say they're not aware? Some are, some aren't. Some are and some aren't. Mm -hmm. Aware of what? Where they are. Who is with them. There are some people that are extremely hypnotizable that go into a very deep sleep that are not aware. Okay. They go in a deep state of hypnosis, you can't do any therapy then. Then you gotta wake them up. I'll show you how to do that. What's a trance? What's a trance? Tell me, who wants a volunteer? What's a trance? Yes? An altered state of consciousness. Altered state of consciousness. Is that your definition of hypnosis? Is it? Who says hypnosis is altered state of consciousness? Come on, let's be honest about this. All right. You're going to alter their conscious? I don't think it's an up and down altered state. I think it's a left to right altered state. OK. And I think no matter how deep that person is, he still knows what's going on. But you altered his consciousness. Is that right? Would you want to tell me what was it like before you changed it? What did you do to change the consciousness? And what did it look like after you changed it? You know, I go to the dictionary and see what's alter. Alter means to amend, modify, make different in some respect, yet retaining its own identity. So you're going to alter the consciousness. And I say, well, OK. Tell me how you did this. How do you know you did this? So a patient comes in. You can hypnotize me, yeah, I'm going to alter your consciousness. Oh, the hell, you want to know where they go. <laughs> I'm going to put you in a trance. Trance means not aware, by definition, of your surrounding circumstances. You have visions of rapture. You're on cloud nine. You're gone. Don't know what's going on around you. When I hear somebody say trance, it burns my fingers and my ears. And the hair on the back of my head stands up. Because nobody's in a trance. And somebody says, we bypassed a critical faculty. <laughs> so what's the critical faculty? Critical faculty, I presume they're talking about, is that you're going to bypass their power to analyze. That's the critical faculty. You're going to analyze what's coming in. You're going to bypass that. 
Well, if you're going to bypass it, then the patient is subject to all of your suggestions because they can't say no to anything. And that isn't true. I'm going to have people up here and I'm going to hypnotize them. Totally aware of what's going on all the time. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to talk. The patient's going to listen. But something is going to happen. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. All right? Describe how and why hypnosis works. Well, I will show you how and why it works, specifically and in detail. Let's begin with the first thing. Well, it didn't cost me any money. We have a problem with it. A person is aware in the conscious state, and let's call it the subconscious state, as being hypnotic state. That's why I ask, is there any question about there? Are they aware of what's going on? The young lady says, well, there might be in a deep coma state, uh, <coughs> comatose state. Well, if they are in that state, you can't do any therapy with them, because you can't get them to think along the lines you need for the therapy. So if they fall asleep on you and they're unaware, you've got to bring them back up where you can talk to them. But let's start off with anybody besides <clears throat> in a deep, deep state, coma state. Are they aware? Yes. Yes. You agree with me? No. Most time. All right. They're aware. They're aware on the conscious state and they're in the subconscious state. Activity. Stand. Can a person stand in the conscious state? Any question about that? Can they also stand in the hypnotic state? How about walk? Talk. Here, see, can we do that in the conscious state? Can we also do that in the, in the subconscious state, hypnotic state? Any question about that? If you have a question, please, you know, let's talk about it. All right. If you can do all these things in both states, then what's the difference? No difference. Up to this point. How about emotion? Depression, fear, love, anger. Anything else you want to put on there? Can we have depression, fear, love, and anger in the conscious state? Can we also have it in the subconscious state? Yes. So since we can experience all of these things in both states, tell me then, what's the difference? Up to this point, there isn't any. All right. If in the conscious state I tell a person, you cannot stand up, can they stand up? Pardon? If he's deep enough, he won't stand. We're talking a conscious state. Oh, sorry. If I tell a person in a state of hypnosis, you can't get out of that chair, and their eyes are wide open, and they look at me, and they can't get out of the chair, and I say, you can't even talk. And when they get up, you can't even sit down. What happened? What happened? They're sitting there, we're talking to one another, eyes wide open. 
And I say, I'm sorry, but you can't get out of the chair. You try to make me a liar. Go ahead, fight it. Try. And they can't get up off the chair. What the heck happened to them? And I can say, I'll pinch you and squeeze you, and you don't feel any pain or a difficulty. What happened? Why? We did dental surgery, periodontal work. I think, Peggy, you saw the, the uh, Channel 12 videotaped two-hour surgery a couple of times. We had different ones. Went in there and took the gum off the jawbone and scraped the whole thing and cut out the infected tissues, extracted out a tooth that was cracked up in the roots, sewn it back up, put 64 stitches in there, opened his eyes and said, how do you feel, Dan? He says, fine, no problem. Two-hour surgery, and we stopped the bleeding like that. Why? What happened to this guy? The dentist was quite apprehensive about it. And they asked, did you take any precautions? He said, no, same thing. We had the emergency phone for any emergency. We didn't do anything different. What happened to this guy? This is what you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to make the changes. Did I alter the person's consciousness? No. Did I bypass the critical faculty? No. Did I put him in a state of highly suggestibility? No. There's something special. So the first half of the definition of hypnosis is a state of awareness. It's a state of awareness. That's the first half. I'll give you the second half later on. Does anybody here have a particular program, step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step program that they work with every, every patient? I don't see any hands up. He has a program with every patient? Uh, basically, yes. Basically. Why do we change a program? Do you have a program for smoking? You have a program for weight, you have a program for cancer, you got a program for pain, you got a program for AIDS. Why? My program is always the same. I don't care what I'm treating. Whether it's pain, frustration, anger, depression, weight, cancer, same thing, up to the level of the therapy. Step by step by step program. All right. Who uses progressive relaxation as a deepening technique or induction? Quite a few. Tony, how do you start? Top or bottom? I prefer to start with the toes and then with the eyes. How about you? I start with the head. With the head. Who starts with the toes? Who starts with the head? The head is right. Why do you start with the toes? I like them with the eyes being... Being what? Being just heavy and... and uh, being you start with the toes, though. Yes, but I end with the eyes. End with the eyes. Yeah. Is there a reason for that? Well, I just want the eyes to be heavy by the time I get to them. Eyes get heavy? Mm -hmm. What do they weigh, a pound? <laughs> or 10 pounds? All right. Would you all do me a favor? You're here to learn today, and I'm here to teach. You paid some money to come here. It costs anywhere from 900, give or take, with the flight and the tra travel and the hotel and so forth. So why don't we all partake in just one little thing with me this morning? It's going to take me more than five minutes. I'd like to have you all just close your eyes. And I don't care, you don't have to get your feet on the floor. Just, just, just close your eyes. Everybody. 
Everybody. Now I'm going to ask you to concentrate on your eyelids and your eye muscles, and you relax your eyelids and your eye muscles. So direct your attention to your eyelids and your eye muscles, and make those eyelids of yours comfortably closed and pleasantly closed. So be aware of what you're doing. And create a feeling, a sensation, in your eyelids and your eye muscles that for you is comfortable, pleasant, and peaceful, restful, and relaxing. Think about it. So you direct your attention to those eyelids and eye muscles, and we let those eyelids relax as much as you can. Now direct your attention to the forehead and around the eyebrows, and you relax the forehead. You make the skin on that forehead nice and soft. You make the skin nice and smooth. If you like, in order to assist you in relaxing the forehead area, picture and imagine that right on the center of the forehead, you got a nice blob of creamy, fluffy lotion. Like somebody reached into a jar and took a nice handful and gently set it on the center of that forehead. Now you know from past experience that lotion is soothing, lotion is comfortable, and lotion is pleasant. Lotion even penetrates and seeps into tiny pores in your skin. So picture and imagine if you can experience the sensation of this lotion slowly beginning to spread and flow across your forehead and soothing and comforting, resting and relaxing and penetrating the tiny pores in your skin deep inside. Imagine this wonderful feeling spreads all the way across your forehead and a feeling of relaxation trickles down over your temples and down into your cheeks. And now you think about your cheeks and you relax your cheeks. You make those cheek muscles of yours nice and limp and rested and relaxed. Hey, you got more to work with there, so go ahead. You relax those cheek muscles as much as you can. Make those cheek muscles real, real loose and limp and rested and relaxed. Give those cheek muscles a feeling that they want to melt, kind of letting go, still stuck there. And you do experience each passing moment, cause your cheek muscles and your eyelids and eye muscles to relax even progressively more. So while your cheek muscles continue to relax more and more, allow some of this relaxation, or if you like, send some relaxation down into your jaw muscles, deep in the jaw muscles. Allow this relaxation to spread over to your chin and up into your lips. Now you think about your lips and you relax your lips. Make those lips of yours nice and soft. Give those lips a tender, soothing feeling, a comfortable sensation, Pleasant? You see, as you allow these muscles to relax, the jaw muscles, the chin, and the jaw muscles to relax, and mouth muscles to relax, you just might experience that your lips have a tendency to part and separate pleasantly and comfortably as the relaxation continues to penetrate even deeper and deeper and deeper. And then imagine from your forehead something soothing, something comfortable, something pleasant, slowly flows and spreads from the forehead up across the top of the head, soothing and caressing Resting, relaxing all the top of the head and spreads down the back of the neck, the back of the head. Then imagine all the sensation of comfort and relaxation seems to become loose and slowly starts to drain down from the top of the head, drain down from the forehead and the eyelids, drain down from the cheeks, drain down from the lips down through the neck into your shoulders and slowly spreads and flows across your shoulders, touching and penetrating, soothing, resting, relaxing all the shoulder muscles. So now you think about the shoulder muscles of yours and let the shoulders become real rested and comfortable and relaxed. And imagine this relaxation spreads all the way across your shoulders and a soothing sensation seems to flow over your shoulders, down your arms. Not only over the skin, but deep, deep, deep in the muscles. Slowly flowing down about the speed that molasses might flow, hardly moving, but penetrating, touching, soothing and caressing all the muscles in your arms, each and every nerve, Every fiber, every cell, every tissue, everything from the shoulders slowly down to the elbows. Now you think about your arms from the elbows to the shoulders and you let your arms become limp and rested and relaxed. Then imagine a sensation of comfort flows past the elbows, not only over the skin but deep, deep inside, penetrating, touching, soothing and caressing. Again, every muscle, everything in its path slowly flows downward, downward, all the way down, down to the wrist. Now you think about your arms from the wrist to the shoulders. You let your arms become totally limp and completely relaxed. Then imagine a sensation of relaxation and comfort slowly spreads past the wrist over the back of the hands, 
a soothing sensation into the palms of the hands, all the way into your fingers and to your fingertips. And now you think about your arms from the fingertips to the shoulders. And you let your arms become totally limp and completely relaxed. Think about it. Now you think about your arms from the fingertips to the shoulders and let your arms become totally limp and completely relaxed. And you find each passing moment. You do relax progressively more and more, feeling more comfortable, more pleasant, more peaceful in your whole mind, in your whole body. Now nice and easy, just open your eyelids. Open them up nice and easy. That's fine. Okay, you see I got you all to relax. Come on, everybody open the eyelids. You can do that. That's fine. Okay. All right. Just wanted you to get it relaxed before we get started. Okay. I have a lot of material to pass out. I don't want to pass it out until after I have a, a session with someone here. And uh, anybody who would think they're a good subject, they would like to be hypnotized up here in my chair. I'm going to spend about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes, going through what I normally go through in a nice little session. Anybody would like to raise their hand? Got one here. Who else would like to? How about you? Would you like to? You got some over there, some over here? All right. You, since you're in the front, I tell you what, I'm going to pick on you after a while. How about you, young lady? You want to come up here? Okay. <clears throat> All right, sit down nice and easy. You have to understand that this is the hypnotic chair. chair. See, everybody who sits in the chair goes into a deep state of hypnosis. See? All right. What I'm going to ask you to do is not try to pick up my, my language. You're going to get the whole thing in a packet, all in script, pretty much. What I'd like to have you do is mark down what you think I'm doing and why I'm doing this, step by step by step. If I say I want you to come backwards 100, you think, what's he doing? What's the purpose and what's he doing? And what am I looking for? I want to see if you can kind of catch some of these things. So what I'm going to do is just kind of ask you to make some notes. What's going through your mind a little bit? What's he doing? Why is he doing it? What's he looking for? All right. Yes, Jan. Jane. 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 Okay. We met before? No. No. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Why don't you just uncross your legs a little bit? Okay. All right. Okay. Look at the palm of my hand up here. You see, by placing my hand in this position, to you, I'm suggesting relaxation. Each and every time I suggest relaxation, you do relax pleasantly and comfortably. I just look at the palm of my hand and cause your eyes to go tired and the eyelids heavy. As I lower my hand closer forward, cause your eyes to go progressively more tired. Eyelids heavy, heavy with relaxation. Before my hand touches your forehead, your eyelids do close and you do relax pleasantly and comfortably. Now you think about your arms and relax your arms. Make your arms nice and limp and rested. All the muscles from the shoulders to the elbows to the wrists to the fingertips. Let your arms become totally limp and relaxed. As you are, let your arms relax, cause your eyes to go tired, eyelids relaxing and closing, 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 and closed. Now that your eyes are closed, just keep them closed. Don't open those eyes until I ask you to open them. Bring me a chair. Even when it's necessary for you to answer my questions, don't open your eyelids, all right? Keep your eyelids closed, comfortably closed and pleasantly closed. Now we did that little bit of progressive relaxation earlier. So once again, you direct your attention to your eyelids and your eye muscles. But this time, really relax those eyelids. Make those eyelids comfortably closed, pleasantly closed. So be aware of what you're doing now. And make those eyelids ever so limp and so rested and so relaxed. Might even want to think to yourself, my eyelids are closed. Hey, it feels nice and dark back here. It's quiet and peaceful and comfortable. So you make those eyelids limp and rested and relaxed. Think about it. 
And you'll find that each passing moment causes your eyelids and eye muscles to relax even progressively more. So while your eyes continue to relax all by themselves, you direct your attention to the forehead now, and you relax the forehead. Once again, make the skin nice and soft. You make the skin on your forehead smooth and comfortable, pleasant and peaceful. Picture and imagine, if you can, that nice blob of creamy, fluffy lotion sitting right in the center of that forehead. Lotion that you know from past experience is comfortable and pleasant. Lotion even penetrates, seeps into tiny pores in your skin, sends that feeling of comfort deep, deep inside. Then imagine this lotion slowly begins to spread and flow across your forehead, soothing and comforting, penetrating, resting, relaxing, deep inside. And imagine this wonderful feeling spreads all the way across your forehead, and some of this nice sensation of comfort trickles down from the forehead, over the temples, down into your cheeks. And now you think about your cheeks and you relax your cheeks. You make those cheek muscles of yours real limp and real rested and real relaxed. But you think about those cheeks. And really let those cheek muscles become ever so limp. So bring upon a sensation, a feeling that you find pleasant and peaceful, restful and relaxing your cheeks. And you'll find that your cheek muscles, like your eyelids and eye muscles, continue to relax even progressively more and more. So while your cheek muscles continue to relax, allow some of this relaxation, or if you like, send some relaxation down to your jaw muscles, deepen the jaw muscles. Spread the relaxation over to your chin and up into your lips. You think about your lips, and now you relax your lips. You make your lips real rested and loose, comfortably relaxed. Come on, think about those lips of yours and relax those lips. And then imagine from the forehead something soothing, something comfortable, something pleasant slowly spreads and flows from the forehead up across the top of the head, soothing and caressing the top of the head, spreads all the way across the top of the head and down the back of the head into the back of the neck. You see, I ask you to relax all those muscles as much as you can. And then imagine you can experience the sensation, the feeling that this relaxation slowly becomes loose and the pleasant feeling of relaxation seems to drain down from the top of the head and the forehead. Pleasantly drain down from the eyelids and the cheeks and from the lips down through the neck into the shoulders and slowly flows and spreads across your shoulders, soothing and caressing, resting, relaxing all the shoulders. Now you think about your shoulders. You think about the large and the small muscles in your shoulders and you let the shoulder muscle become totally limp and completely relaxed. Then imagine the sensation of relaxation spreads all the way across your shoulders and slowly flows down both of your arms. Think about that. Something soothing, something comfortable, something very pleasant. Slowly flowing down over the skin and also deep, deep inside. Touching, soothing and caressing all the muscles in your arms, each and every nerve, all the fibers and the tendons, even every cell. Shoulders all the way down to the elbows. Now you think about your arms from the elbows to the shoulders and you let those arms of yours become real rested and relaxed. Then allow this relaxation to spread and flow past the elbows again, down your arms. Not only over the skin, but deep, deep inside, touching and penetrating, soothing and comforting, resting and relaxing. Everything in its path is relaxation flows downward, down, down to the wrist. Now you think about your arms from the wrist to the shoulders. You let your arms become just totally limp and completely relaxed. Then allow this relaxation to spread over the back of the hands. Imagine something soothing flowing into the palms of the hands, spreads through your fingers and to your fingertips. Now you think about your arms from your fingertips to the shoulders. You let your arms become totally limp and completely relaxed. And then imagine from the shoulders something soothing, something comfortable, something pleasant. Slowly flows down from your shoulders, down over the chest area, deep inside, spreads all the way across your chest and down the sides of your body. And from the back of the shoulders, imagine something soothing flowing down the back muscles, soothing and caressing. Imagine your body being covered, draped if you like, in the most pleasant, the most comfortable, the most peaceful, the most restful, the most relaxed feeling you could ever imagine. Slowly flowing from shoulders down through the chest area, and from the back of the shoulders down the back, down into the lower back, and from the chest area down into the stomach area. And all this sensation of relaxation slowly drains down into the hips, spreads all the way across your hips, penetrates deep, deep inside. Momentarily stops at the hips. So I asked you to relax your body from the top of the head all the way down to the hips. 
Then imagine this relaxation slowly again becomes loose and starts to drain down from the hips, down through the thigh muscles, soothing and caressing the thigh muscles, down past the knees to the ankles and into the feet and right to the toes. So I ask you to relax your body from the top of the head all the way down to the toes. Now there's a purpose in me asking you to relax your body. You see, in your body, you've got a lot of human energy. But so much of your energy is locked up, tied up, knotted up in the muscles and the tissues. And as you allow your body to relax, this human energy is automatically released and slowly floats up your body, almost like tiny little bubbles of energy letting go from your toes, bubbles of energy rising up your feet. And as these bubbles of energy rise up your feet and your legs, they bounce against more tissues, more cells, more muscles, shaking more bubbles of energy loose, filling your thighs full of moving, rising, bouncing bubbles of energy, crowding more bubbles into the hips, gathering more into the stomach area. And from your fingertips, bubbles of energy letting go, slowly trickling up your hands. And as these bubbles of energy rise up your hands, they too bounce against other cells and muscles and tissues, shaking more bubbles of energy loose. And all these bubbles of energy, they converge and they meet in your shoulders. Then one by one, the bubbles trickle up the back of your neck, the back of the head, to the top of the head, and almost like they disappear, but they don't. They just take on a whole new identity. And what I'm going to do is teach you how to redirect this energy so you can fulfill your new needs and new desires. So understand, the more you relax, the more energy you have to work with. The more you have to work with, the better results you're going to get. Now all you got to do is sit in this chair and just take it easy and just relax and get comfortable. You see, earlier you and I talked about hypnosis. And I told you, at no time during the course of this session are you going to be unconscious or unaware. So please don't expect this to happen to you. Because if you fall asleep, I'm going to wake you up. You see? And your thoughts may drift to another subject. If that happens, don't be concerned about that. That's a no normal and natural function of your thought process. If you want to redirect your attention back to what I'm talking about, hey, that's perfectly okay. Frankly, it doesn't make much difference, you see. Your subconscious mind is already open and receptive to everything that you and I talk about and all your needs and all your desires, and I'm also satisfied that you recognize that you can relax even more than you are now. So in a moment, I'm going to have you count like this. 100. No, no. In a moment, I'm going to have you count 100, and then 99, 98, 97, 96. And when you start counting, you just whisper so softly I can hardly hear you. And then slowly, very slowly, count backwards. Now, nice and easy, whisper. One hundred. That's fine. And slowly count backwards. That's fine. Now, while you're counting backwards, again, direct your attention to. They find it faint away, disappearing, going, gone, and no longer important. Now I tell you what I'd like to have you do. Picture and imagine that you're standing in a classroom, any kind of a classroom, one you've been in before or imaginary classroom. And as you stand in the classroom, I want you to look around. And as you look around the classroom, you just might see the chairs that the students sit in. Might be a combination desk and chair, maybe an armchair or a plain old chair any kind of a chair. Most classrooms have a teacher's desk. Some classrooms have windows. And on the walls you might find some posters, pictures, bulletins, decorations, maybe some students work. Then there's this nice big chalkboard in the classroom. So picture and imagine you're standing in a classroom, any kind of a classroom, as you stand in a classroom, look around. You might just see the chairs that the students sit in possibly a teacher's desk, something on the walls, and the chalkboard. When the picture of the chalkboard is reasonably clear in your mind, just nod your head, yes, I can picture this chalkboard. Walk up to the chalkboard that you picture and imagine. And you stand about a foot and a foot and a half away from the chalkboard. And you look at the chalkboard. Standing so close to the chalkboard, chances are all you can see is the chalkboard. So while you're standing facing the chalkboard, looking at the chalkboard, Allow your eyes to drift down to the bottom of the chalkboard, and there's a ledge, and on the ledge is a piece of chalk and eraser. With one hand, you pick up the chalk, the other hand, the eraser. And now you should be standing facing the chalkboard, chalk in one hand, the eraser in the other. 
And when you're standing there facing the chalkboard, chalk in one hand, erasing the other, just nod your head, yes, I'm there. With the chalk you have in one hand, slowly and very carefully, write the letter A on the chalkboard. Take your time, slow and easy. When you have the letter A on the chalkboard, and with the eraser you have in the other hand, slowly and very carefully and very nice, erase the letter A from the chalkboard. Take your time. When the letter A has been erased from the chalkboard, just nod your head yes, the letter A has been erased. Now with the chalk you still have in one hand, nice and easy, draw the letter B on the chalkboard. Hey, and the letter B is a nice letter. Letter B has a lot of loops and turns and twists. It's a pretty letter. And when you have the letter B on the chalkboard, with the eraser you still have in one hand, slowly and very carefully erase the letter B from the chalkboard. Take your time, up and down if you like, maybe back and forth or round and round. Any way you want to erase the letter B is fine. When the letter B has been erased from the chalkboard, just nod your head yes, the letter B has been erased from the chalkboard, that's fine. With the chalk you still have in one hand, slowly and very carefully write the letter C on the chalkboard. Take your time, we're in no hurry. Letter C is a simple letter, not much to the letter C. When you had the letter C on the chalkboard with the eraser again, slowly and ever so carefully, erase the letter C from the chalkboard. Take your time, nice and easy. Now in a moment, I'm gonna have you continue with the rest of the alphabet. When I ask you to start, you're gonna start with the letter D. But please, don't start until I ask you to. You see, I'm going to have you write the letter D very slowly and very carefully on the chalkboard. And then you're going to erase the letter D just as easy and slowly as you can. And then I'm going to have you continue slowly writing and erasing the letters of the alphabet. And each move of the eraser causes you to relax progressively more and more. With each move of the eraser, you are relaxing, you're feeling more comfortable, more pleasant, more peaceful, your mind and body. Now, nice and easy. Start with the letter D. Slowly write the letter D on the chalkboard, and when you're ready, erase the letter D from the chalkboard. And then you continue slowly writing and erasing the letters of the alphabet while I talk to you. You might remember when you first became acquainted with the letters of the alphabet, some letters were simple, some letters were difficult. Some were confusing. The easy letters could have been the O, the S, the X, or the T, but there was a P and a Q kind of twisted backwards. Might have had a problem with the D and the B, or the M and the N, or the U, the V, and the W. Then when you tried to recite the alphabet, the time you got down to a certain line of the alphabet, and you couldn't remember the next succeeding letter. The harder you tried, the more difficult it became. So you decided to go back to A and B and C, hoping to pick one you couldn't remember. And now as you continue to erase, go ahead, erase away all the remaining letters of the alphabet, put them all important, let them fade away, disappear, and go on. Now you put the chalk and eraser back on the ledge. And when the chalk and eraser is back on the ledge, just nod your head, yes, the chalk is there. I'd like to have you look around in this classroom. And as you look around, you're going to find a door that leads from the classroom. When you recognize the door that leads from the classroom, just nod your head, yes, I see this door. You see the door you're looking at leads to a library. You know what a library looks like, don't you? Library's got a lot of bookshelves. Bookshelves in rows, and on the bookshelves are many, many books. So walk over to the library door, open the library door, step into the library, close the library door behind you. Then look around in this library. And when you recognize the bookshelves, just nod your head, yes, I can see the bookshelves. Now in a moment, I'm gonna have you walk and stand between two bookshelves and look down the aisle. And when you look down the aisle, you're going to find the books on the right side. They're pleasant books. They're nice books. Books they've been read and books they've been used. Books on the other side aren't so nice. So go ahead. And you select any aisle in this library. And you stand between the bookshelves and look down the aisle. When you're standing between the bookshelves looking down the aisle, just nod your head, yes, I'm there. Yeah. You see, the books on the right side, they're nice books. The books on the other side, not so nice. See, I've got to tell you all about these books. All these books are about you. Everything that you ever did in your whole lifetime is recorded in these books as you look down this aisle. Not only everything you ever did in your whole lifetime, but every thought that you ever had in your whole lifetime. And all your emotions and feelings, your symptoms, your fantasies and your dreams. Everything that you ever thought about, all your experiences, your emotions and feelings, 
They're all recorded in these books as you look down the aisle. The books on the right side, the nice books, the pleasant books, they hold your nice experiences, your wonderful thoughts, your good feelings, and your nice dreams. The books on the other side, they hold those not so nice. The books closest to you, these books hold your most recent experiences. That's the things you did today and yesterday and the day before. Not only your most recent experiences, but your most recent thoughts, most recent feelings, emotions, even your most fantasies and your most recent dreams. And farther down the aisle, the books about you when you were younger and smaller. And these books hold the things that you did when you were younger and smaller. What you thought about when you were younger and smaller and how you felt when you were younger and smaller. Even the dreams you had when you were younger. And way on the far end, the books are about you when you were just a baby. And these books hold and record the things you did when you were a baby. What you thought about and how you felt. Even the dreams you had. And these books are full of pictures. Pictures of everything that you ever did in your whole lifetime. And I'm not going to ask you what's in any one of your books. So I'll tell you what you do. You look at the books on the right side. Face the books on the right side. Then slowly, very slowly, you walk down the aisle. Touch, if you like, the books that you go by. Walk halfway down the aisle and stop. When you get halfway down the aisle, reach up on the right side. Take a book off the shelf and hold this book in your hands. <coughs> When you had the book in your hand, just nod your head, I have a book. You see, this book is about you when you were younger. And this book has pictures of the lovely things you did when you were younger. I'm not going to ask you what's in this book. So open this book to a picture about you doing something pleasant when you were younger. And when you see a picture, just nod your head, yes, I see a picture. If there's no picture there, shake your head, no. Close the book. Put it back on the shelf on the right side. Then very slowly, nice and easy, continue to walk down the aisle. Walk all the way down to the end of the bookshelf and stop. Take one small step backward. Reach up on the right side. Take another book off the shelf and hold this book in your hands. When you had this book in your hands, just nod your head, yes, I have this book. This book is about you when you were just a baby. And this book has pleasant pictures of the lovely things you did when you were a baby. Give this book a hug and a squeeze to your chest. It's a treasured book of lovely experiences when you were just a baby. Open this book to a picture about you doing something pleasant when you were just a baby. And when you see a picture, just nod your head, I see a picture. No picture there, shake your head, no. Close the book, put the book back on the shelf on the right side. Now look at the books on the other side. These books are not so nice. Some of these books, only some of these books, are problem books. You see, every problem that you ever had in your whole lifetime has its own book. Every problem has its own title. And everything that you ever did as it relates to that problem is recorded in that problem book. And also recorded in that problem book are all of your emotions and feelings, your thoughts about a particular problem. And on the not so nice side, you have a book sitting up there that has a title, Stress, S-T-R-E-S-S. -S. And when you recognize your stress problem book, nod your head, yes, I see that one. Reach up and take the stress problem off the shelf and hold this problem in your hands. And understand what you're holding. What you're holding in your hand is every past stressful experience that you ever had in your whole lifetime. You're also holding in your hand every past stressful thought. All your past stressful feelings and emotions, your past stressful dreams. And some of these have a tendency to creep in today's and tomorrow's conduct. But you see, they're no longer important for you in light of today's circumstances. So look around on the floor of this aisle as a container that you hadn't noticed before. When you recognize the container on the floor of this aisle, just nod your head, I see the container. Take your stress problem to the container and you throw your stress problem in the container. Get rid of it. When your problem, stress problem is in the container, just nod your head, it's in the container. Now you go back to that not so nice side, the problem side. You got another problem sitting there, and that's your book of I can'ts. You got a book that has a title, I Can't. And that I Can't problem book holds every I Can't that you ever thought about, every I Can't that you ever used, every I Can't that you ever created. You put your I Can'ts into your I Can't problem book, sentence after sentence, paragraph after paragraph, page after page, chapter after chapter. You got a book full of lousy I Can'ts. When you recognize your I Can't problem book, just nod you, I see that one. 
You take your I can problem off the shelf. You take your problem to the container, but don't throw the problem into the container. You sit on the floor next to the container. You put your I can problem in your lap. Open up the cover. Tear out the first page. Tear that first page in small pieces. You throw the pieces into the container. Then you proceed to tear up <coughs> each and every one of your I can'ts. And tear all your I can'ts in small pieces and throw the pieces in the container. For as you tear up your I can'ts, this causes you to free yourself and your subconscious mind of each and every one of your restrictions, all your limitations, and all your inhibitions. As you tear up your I can'ts, you're taking back total and complete control over everything that you do, that you think about, and how you feel. So feel good about it. Tear all your I can'ts out, tear all your I can'ts in small pieces, and throw all the pieces into the container. When all the I can'ts have been destroyed and thrown in the container, toss the cover into the container because you're never going to need the cover anymore. When the cover's in the container, just nod your head, the cover's gone. Now you can stand up and go back to that problem site. I don't know. Maybe you got some more problems. So look around. Should you find any more problems up there, you take your problems off the shelf, you throw your problems in the container. I'm not going to ask you to tell you your problems, so go ahead and clean the house. Should you need another, another container, look around, there's another container. Take your time. Get rid of all the problems you want to get rid of. No hurry. And when all your problems are in the container, you take your time, just nod your head, yes, the problems are gone. Take your time. Now you stand back away from the container or containers, whatever the case may be, for the containers start to slide and glide away from you. Door in the library opens up, and right through the doorway goes the containers taking all your problems you want to get rid of. When the container and the problems are gone, the door automatically closes. When the door is closed, just nod your head, yes, the door is closed. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, I'm going to clap my hands. When I do that, it causes all those problems of yours to explode in a million of pieces and all the pieces flutter like confetti into the wind. One, two, three. Now, walk up back up the aisle to the point you first enter the aisle. And there's a nice comfortable chair in your library. Go sit down in the chair. And when you're in the chair in the library, just nod your head, yes, I'm in the chair. That's fine. Now, I think you did a pretty good job. So I'd like to have you do something, is relax your body. Why don't you relax your legs? That means everything from the thigh, from the hips, the thigh muscles, down to the knees, all the way down to the ankles, and into the feet, and right to your toes. Relax your arms, if you like, shoulders to the elbows, to the wrists, to the fingertips. You can even relax your chest and the stomach area. You may even relax your eyelids, your cheeks. You allow your whole body to relax. You might just experience that your right leg seems to relax more than the rest of your body. Why the right leg means a little bit useless, maybe a little bit numb with relaxation. Might even feel like the right leg is beginning to fall asleep, numb and useless. Yet you recognize you got a shoe on the end of the foot. And that shoe may feel like a heavy, heavy boot. Might even feel like a heavy lead boot. Might even feel like an anchor that's chained down to the floor. Heavy anchor, chainly chained to the floor. And so heavy is the anchor, and so tight is the chain. And so useless is your right leg that you can even extend your foot out straight. For as you think about extending your foot, your very thoughts cause the leg to become totally numb and completely useless. Actually, the knee locked in that position. Anchor's too heavy. But you think about that right leg of yours, and you try to push your foot out and straighten out, you find it can't even budge it. But think about it. Think about it. Think about it. No. I'm going to touch you on the right knee nice and easy. As I do that, it causes the left leg to become just as numb and useless as your right one. Totally useless. Now you can't put any leg out. Stuck right there. You're going to touch both knees nice and easy to do so. It causes your arms from the shoulder to the fingertips. They're totally numb and completely useless. <coughs> shoulder to the fingertips. Now you can't even lift your arms, but think about that. You see, as you think about lifting your arms, your very thoughts cause your arms to become numb and useless. Totally useless. Think about it. You try to lift your hands and find you can't. You see, I'm going to say to you, you try to make me a liar. I say you can't move your arms, you can't move your legs. But think about it. Think about it. Now, still remaining pleasant and relaxed, I want you to open your eyes and slowly bring your head up nice and easy. 
Yeah. But you see your arm still numb, numb and useless. Totally useless. Yeah. Knees locked in that position, and as you look at your feet down there, you see, it causes your feet to come locked, roots stuck to the floor. And as your feet lock tighter to the floor, it causes your knees, it causes your foot, your legs, from your toes all the way to the hips to get numb and useless. As your hindery gets heavy, you might feel like it's a big piece of lead in there holding you tight down there, tight. As your hindery gets heavier, it causes your arms to be totally limp. As your arms become limp, it causes suction comes to jump out from the back of the chair, holding you tight. As a matter of fact, you can't even get out of the chair. You see, as you think about getting out of the chair, your thoughts cause your feet lock tighter. Knees locked in that position, legs totally useless, arms totally useless. What you think about it, you try to stand up and find you can't. But go ahead and think about it. Look at me. You try to make me a liar. I am. Can't get up, can you? No. Are you aware of what's going on here? Yes. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. I feel like an idiot. <laughs> oh, that's all right. You didn't hear her, she said, I feel like an idiot, yeah. But you can, it's all right. Okay, close your eyes and relax. You see what I'm going to do? Just to set my fingers, do so. Cause your legs and arms and the whole body are perfect normal. It's nice and easy. Now you sit in that comfortable chair in your nice little. in the library and relax. You see, I want you to understand what you did. You, you did what I call mind surgery. You see, a, a, a surgeon may open up the area around the stomach and take out a, a troublesome appendix. Once the appendix has been removed and cast into a container, it can't bother that person anymore. Or like a dentist may extract a troublesome tooth. Once a tooth has been extracted, it can't give the person any more difficulty. And you went on into your little memory bank, your library of knowledge, your reservoir of knowledge, and you got rid of some of your problems. You took them off the shelf, you threw them in the container, and out the door they went. Can't bother any more problems anymore. You see, on a conscious level, you gather all that information, your lifetime of experience, thoughts, and feelings. You put it into your little library. You filled your books with every experience, every thought, every emotion, feeling. And your little subconscious mind's been meandering up and down that aisle, reading your books and whispering to the brain what to do based upon what you put in. Now when your subconscious mind walks up and down and says, well, came down here and cleaned the house and I might tickle because I don't have to tell the brain anymore all those problems. They're gone. No longer important for you. So I tell you what to have you do. You walk, get out of that chair and you walk back down that aisle again. Keep your eyes on the right side, bottom shelf. Close your eyes. And when you're between the books, uh, Bookshelves, it's not you hit, I'm there again. All right. Look on the right side, bottom shelf, there's books that are wrapped up you hadn't noticed before. When you recognize the wrapped up books on the right side, bottom shelf, just now you see those. Reach down and pick up a book that's wrapped up and hold this book in your hands. When you have this book in your hands, it's not you hit, I have this book. See that this book also has a title. The title of this book is Health and Happiness. Unwrap your Health and Happiness book. And when your health and happiness book is unwrapped, you put it up on the shelf on the right side, position that's important. Reach down a second time and pick up another book that's wrapped up. Second book also has a title. The title of the second book is Success. Unwrap your success book and put your success book up on the shelf next to your health and happiness book. You've got two books up there, health and happiness and success. When your success book is on the shelf, reach down a third time and pick up a book that's wrapped up. Hold this book in your hands. When you had this book in your hand, just now you had I had this book. You get this book a hug and a squeeze to your chest because for you it's a very, very important book. The title of this book is Desires. Every desire that you ever had in your whole lifetime for health and happiness and success is wrapped up. Unwrap your desire book. Then put your desire book up on the shelf next to the health and happiness and success. Three books up there. Health and happiness, success and desires. When your, desire, when your desire book is on the shelf, walk back up the aisle and go sit down in that comfortable chair in your library. When you're in a chair in the library, just nod your head, I'm in the chair. You see, by unwrapping these three books, you made a commitment. You made a commitment that everything you do from this moment on and for the rest of your life causes you to be healthy and happy. It says in your health and hand book, subconscious mind never allow me nor never cause me to do anything that for me is unhealthy or makes me unhappy. 
and this commitment is absolute. By unwrapping your success book, you made a commitment that everything you do from this moment on for the rest of your life, you do because you are successful in everything. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. You just took back discretion. And your desire book. Your desire book holds and contains every desire that you ever had in your whole lifetime for health and happiness and success. Your subconscious mind, in its unlimited capacity, can and does influence everybody and anybody to bring upon for you your desires. So you made a commitment to fulfill your desires. So feel good about it. I think you did a terrific job. Now I'm going to count up to three. When I count to three, your eyelids do open, and you're alert and you're back in your conscious state, feeling wonderful, pleasant, peaceful, your mind and body. One, two, and three. That's fine. Let's give this little girl a hand, huh? Okay. I think she did a wonderful job. Okay, go back and sit down there. All right. It's Why don't we take a, a little break and we can kick this thing around, talk about yourselves what we did, and take a 15-minute break for coffee and uh, a rest call if you want, and we'll get back in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. <laughs> Quarter after. All right. While I'm here, would you be able to give me a private session? And then there's also a four, four sheet. It's called the brain diagram. No, no, yeah, diagram. Four pages. Dave, this one here. <clears throat> All right. I ask you to make some notations. Why did I do something? What did I do? Why did I do it? And what did I expect from it? Uh, can we have some input? Can we? Somebody want to tell me? Yes, back there. No, no. How I did what? Oh, well, she's close, and I got it on here. But I'll get somebody back there after a while. Maybe you will come up here. You, maybe. Uh, you had a hand up back here. Somebody over here. I'm not even sure if she volunteered. I think you may have volunteered her. Oh, she had her hand up. Did she? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I did notice that she was one of the people you told to open her eyes twice. So you might look around for those people that. Had yeah, I told her to open her eyes twice. Yeah. That's right. No. I want the big packet and the and <coughs> all right. We'll get a lot <coughs> I'll have many up here. Yes? Uh, the, the the letters on the board, what was was that another deepening technique? The, the letters like the letter no, A no. I want you to tell me why I did that. 
think it was you were deepening it. You That's a deepening technique, but what in the, what in the, the ABCs is the deepening technique? It was the erasing, I think. You know, it's the half of it. I said each move that the eraser causes, causes, causes. If I use the word once, I'll use it a thousand times. The biggest word in hypnosis is cause, with a great big C. You write that down. This causes, the whole world is based upon cause and effect. If you as a therapist want something to happen in this body, you have to cause it to happen. You have to create it. Nothing happens unless you make it happen. Nothing is taken away unless you take it away. Yes? Can we go to that light? Just turn to the right. Yeah. All right. So in the, in the uh, ABCs, is that okay? Each move of the eraser causes you to relax more and more. And what did I say after that? With each move of the eraser, you are relaxing deeper and deeper. One is the cause, one is the result. You'll find in the chapter that I'm passing out, the word cause and are are underlined. That means they're important. OK? What else? The other word you used a lot was you would say, think about it. You yeah. bring people back to their thinking process. You bet. That's all I work with, the thought process. I have them think, 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 think. And if they're in a trance state, a coma state, they can't think. All right? What else in the ABCs that I do? You smiled when I was doing it. It's because I was stealing. Were you trying to confuse her? You bet I was. I confused her. I created mental disorientation. That's right. You see, she didn't understand it. So in effect, what I did is I pulled the rug out from under and I dropped her in a hole. I'm not sure how I do that. All right. What else did I do and why did I do it? You got some more notes there? Why did you confuse her yes. disorientation? I'll get through that. Yes? No, no, uh, <coughs> not quite. What did I do? What else did I do up here? She kept going back and, and deepening the body relaxation a lot of times and using the same words over and over. How did I do that? She kept going back and um, you know, reminding her that her arms were relaxed. Progressive relaxation. Well, that's the testing. I tested her. Yes? She said, time. I had her relaxed all the time. No hurry. That's important. I had her come back for some 100, didn't I? Why did I have her do that? Yes? That's the second half. Each decreasing number causes you to relax more and more. With each decreasing number, you are relaxing. And then I got her into the stress. <coughs> and how did I do that? She's counting backwards, and I said, hey, while you're counting backwards, direct your attention to your arms and relax your arms. Arms? Yeah. That's everything from the shoulder to the elbow to the wrist to the fingertips. So she's trying to count backwards, and she's trying to do this here, mental disorientation. I do that about four times in a session, and four times I jerk the rug from under her. All right. I'll explain the other half of my definition. First of all, I want you to understand that you don't treat anybody or consider anybody that comes to see you as being stupid, per se. You treat them 
like they are the most stupid person in this whole world. Because if you say, relax your arms, you've got to say, hey, this person doesn't know what the arms are. That's from the shoulder to the elbow to the wrist to the fingertips. That's what you do. You relax your legs, thigh muscles past your knees to your ankles and your feet and your toes. You have to be specific. You have to be detailed, and you have to use repetition. Because the more detailed, the more specific you are, the more terrific the results you're going to get. You leave nothing to interpretation. Okay, who stole my chalk? <laughs> I got a chalk holder. <laughs> put a circle up here and put a B in it. You're going to get a handout with what I'm talking about here. The most important part of your body is the brain. The brain runs, rules, and controls every, every, every cell in your whole body. The brain is divided in half. You've got two sides, left and right hemispheres. From the moment of conception up to birth, nine months. Every minute for nine months, you grow 250,000 new brain cells. 250,000 per minute for nine months. So by the time that you're born or the person is born, they have roughly 100 billion brain cells. And you continue to grow brain cells until you're about eight and a half years old. Strange thing I read in the magazine just yesterday. It says that when you're born, you're born with all the brain neurons that you ever have. Well, it's not true. But you grow brain cells at a declining rate. So for nine months, except for the first three weeks, you grow 250,000 per minute. <coughs> but by the time you're through growing the brain of yours, you have roughly 400 billion brain cells. 400 billion. And your brain doesn't weigh four pounds. All compact right in there. That's the guy that runs your whole body. Or the girl, if you want it. We call it an it, then, if you want it. That's the boss. You got a brain divided in half, you got a body divided in half, and your mind is also divided in half. You've got a conscious part of your thinking process, and you've got a subconscious part of your thinking process. You want to come up here before? Yeah. You volunteer to come up? Come on up now. I'm not going to hypnotize you. Ask you a couple of little silly questions, that's all. Okay. Okay, sit down. All right. Okay. On the conscious level, you're gathering all this information. Whatever you did, whatever you felt, whatever you thought about, you put it into the brain. Everything, everything is stored in the brain. And all those brain cells you have, there's not one cell that's called mind or consciousness. So your mind does not exist in your body in any shape, any form, occupies absolutely no space. It's like a spirit that goes through there. That's what it is. In my theory, it's a little bit different than some of yours, so we won't get into theories. But everything is stored into the brain. Not only does your brain.
toast and fruit and coffee? Okay, erase it. Okay. Put in ham and eggs instead. Right. Okay, can you do that? Not really. No, you can lie to me, can't you? Right. But you can't change it. Okay, right. all right. Uh, how about dinner last night? Um, yeah, okay. Um, What'd you have? Oh, I had cream cheese on toast and sprouts. <laughs> okay, that's last night, right? That was last night. How about night before last? Um, I think the same thing. What did you wear the night before last when you had dinner? What did I wear? Can you do me a favor? Yeah. Look at me. Okay. What did you wear the night before last when you had dinner? Stay with me. I don't remember. Well, think about it. Stay with me, though. Stay with me. No, 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 no. Stay with me. Um, I think I had silk pantsuit on. Okay. How about last Sunday? You had dinner last Sunday? Now stay with me. <laughs> I think so. What did you have for dinner? I don't know. Ah, okay, go sit down. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you can't look at me and think. No. Did you watch her? Yeah. I asked her questions. She kept turning her eyes away from me. Right. You see, on the conscious side, you feed all information. Once you put it in, you can't take it out, you can't change it. If you have an opportunity, you might decide, do I believe it? Is it important? Is there any truth in what I'm hearing? Can I use it? The more important it is, the more believable, the offering you're going to use it. So you decide to accept certain things, you put it into the memory bank because you intend to use it. You'll file it someplace. And since it all goes in, the rest of the information is rejected, relegated, deposited in the junkyard of your memory bank, way back there. It's always there. Sometimes you got to trigger it out in order to have it come out. Tell me, young fellow, when you went to school, did you recite the poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb? Sometimes. I'm not, I don't remember where You don't remember it? I remember Mary, but... Okay. <laughs> Who knows Mary Had a Little Lamb? How's it go? Mary had a little lamb, his fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Second verse? I have no idea. It followed? Ah, uh -uh. it followed her. To school one day, it was against the rule. It made the children. Laugh and play to see a limb yeah, see? You trigger it out, it comes out, it's always there, it stays there. They can do this. And sometimes, you know, you're hearing something, you said, hey, happened to me 20 years ago. You see? All of a sudden, it filters out. You can trigger it out. Once it's in there, it's there to stay. Nobody loses memory. Nobody loses memory. What we lose is the capacity to recall previously acquired information. Alzheimer's patients don't lose memory. That's right. As long as they have a brain, it's there. They can't dig it out. Believe me, I've been through this, and I've been challenged, and I've proven it. All right. So what you're doing on this side, you're feeding, and then you go over this side, And you read what you put in on that side. So on a conscious side, you feed. On a subconscious mind, you access your memory bank. And the farther it the longer it's been there, the farther it's been removed, the deeper in the state of hypnosis you have to go to access way back there. It's all back there. So what do we do on the conscious side? We put in. messages, and I call them programs. Well, as long as you're this close, young man, why don't you stand up? Now you sit down. In order for you to stand up, you had to move some muscles, didn't you? Tell me, which muscles did you move first? And last? 
How many? You see, we have no idea. How many we moved? All he did was made a decision. That's all. And the minute he made the decision to stand up, subconscious mind says, hey brain, you run this body, we got a decision. He wants to stand up, so you move 168 give or take muscles. And he stood up. I said, would you sit down? He could have said, hey, wait a while. You're playing games with me? <laughs> you asked me to stand up, you want me to sit down, why don't you just leave me here? See, he wouldn't sit down until he made that decision. So he got a decision to sit down, and the subconscious mind says, brain, we got a decision, a message, you want to sit down, so you activate the sit down program. And then he sent another message in, all by himself. He thought it was funny. And sure enough, he started to smile. He put the smile message in because he thought it was funny. Okay, let me tell you more about what you do. The gentleman get up in the morning, pick up the razor, you start to shave. And you start in the same place every day. And you got a regular routine. The girls get up, put on the makeup, and they start in the same place all the time. That's right. And if nighttime you brush your teeth, you put the toothpaste on the brush either one way or the other, but it's always the same way. You start brushing your teeth the same place all the time. A regular program that you follow. If you took a shower this morning, you got up and picked the soap in one hand, it's the same hand you used yesterday and the day before, same one you use tomorrow. And you start to wash yourself in the same place all the time. What are you doing? You're just making a decision to do something and your body begins to activate the same thing because the brain runs the body. It does the, all this movement. No conscious effort. And you walk. We always walk the same way unless we're injured. <coughs> and we all walk a little bit different. That's our program. Everything that you do in life is preceded by a thought. All your emotions and feelings are preceded by a thought. So if a person has a problem, you're going to say, when did it start? What was that person thinking about? Or what, or who put it in there? The thought is what you're looking for. You need some more? Yeah. On the desk. So what you're doing, you're feeding all this in here, and your subconscious mind is activating. People say, you know, I can't ride an elevator. They can walk past the elevator without thinking about going in. They'll go by it a hundred times. Doesn't bother them. But the minute they decide to walk in, they start walking in, all of a sudden, they're activating the problem that I can't ride the elevator, and they get like this. If they say, I can ride if it's, all, if it's empty and I'm alone. I can stand one person, but two or three, I'm out of there. So they walk up and they're getting anxious and they push the button and it's empty. Oh, they walk in, push the 20th floor, goes up five floors and it stops. And all of a sudden the old tension gets in there. Door opens, only one person. He says, ah, oh, it's only one. I can handle this. Goes up five more floors and it stops and there's five people there. Wow. Subconscious mind says, brain, five more people. He says he can't stand it. So you bounce him off the floor, off the wall and kick him out. He goes flying right out of there. That's right. It all starts up here. Nothing starts unless there's a message. So what are we doing here? We're putting messages in, in the subconscious mind. The brain follows only two, two messages. To do something or stop doing it. Excitatory, inhibitory messages. If you can sit there and say, I don't want to go to the bathroom, I'm not going to the swimming pool, I'm not getting out of this chair, I'm not going anywhere, you don't go anywhere. Until you make a mind to do something. You put the message in, if you decide to go from here to get coffee, you're not going to end up in my swimming pool back here, or the back in here. You're not going to be going to the bathroom. 
If you decide to get coffee and run go to the bathroom, you have to have an intervening or interrupting thought to change your course. That's with everything in life. You want to change direction, you got to change the thought. All right, so on a conscious side, you feed. Once you put it in, you're through with it. Subconscious mind has been reading your books in your library. That's right. And telling the brain what to do based upon what's in that library, your memory bank. So we got programs in there. If you think you can't, I have to get ready, I can't, in order to get them to do something. Now, how do we do that? You see, I showed you that on the conscious side, you can't get in there. She couldn't. I said, look at me and try to think. No way. Unless it's on a peripheral edge of your memory bank, recent or important, you can access it. But you put it back, put it back, put it back. You see, our problems have their origin in the thought. The thought doesn't have to be concurrent with the event. It can be a long, deep-seated thought that manifests itself at a particular time. All right. So normally in adults, the conscious mind is the boss, and the subconscious mind sits down below. They have a conversation. Subconscious mind says, hey, buddy, you gather all that information, you analyze it all, and you put all your decisions, your choices, your perception into that memory bank, and I will read it, and the brain and I will carry them out. We'll do exactly what you asked us to do. We'll carry out your messages. I'm your faithful, I'm your humble servant. Ask me and I get it done. Well, if you got a faithful, humble servant, let's make that subconscious mind the boss. So as therapist, this is what you have to do. You gotta make that subconscious mind top dog. So what you have to do is take that conscious awareness and you make it less efficient. That's all. And they work like a teeter-totter or balancing scale. And you only work, you only work with the conscious part. The conscious goes up or down, or down and up, whichever you want to call it, and the subconscious mind follows as a matter of course. All right? So I hypnotized her. We call that induction. How do you hypnotize somebody? I hypnotize every one of you this morning. I said, close your eyes. All induction procedures ends up in eye closure. So I go through the gymnastics of fiddle fooling around. I say, close your eyes. Hey, you're there. What is the effect of closing the eyelids? In each eye, you've got 120 million cells that are called rods and cones. And these cells are sensitive to light, movement, and color. 120 million, each eye. 240 million cells are shut down by closing the eyelids. You shut down anywhere from 30 <coughs> to 50,000 optic nerves <coughs> that run from the eyes back to the visual cortex in the back of your head. You shut down hundreds of thousands of nerves that correlate vision and movement. Actually what you do, you drop that subconscious mind or the conscious mind down by one-eighth. Closing the eyelids drops you down one-eighth. The conscious mind comes down one-eighth, the subconscious mind comes up one-eighth. Comes up. What else did I have her do? I said, you think about your eyelids and you relax your eyelids. Your body is a sponge for outside sen sensitivity. That's right. You shut it down a little at a time. Eyelids, the cheek muscles, all the way down, 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 down to the toes. So you drop it down a little bit more. Now there's two ways of putting a person into hypnosis. 
We can do it by design what I did here. Or when a person is stressed out, frustrated, traumatized, they enter unintentional, spontaneous hypnosis. We call it the fight or flight syndrome. When you can't logically and reasonably stand there and solve your problem, you go bananas, how the hell would I'm taking off? Unintentional, spontaneous hypnosis by stress. So what did I do? I combined them both. I asked her to count backwards from 100. While she's counting backwards, I tell her to relax her arms. I took her thought process and I shifted around. And finally she's thinking, to heck with it. I don't even bother with this anymore. That's her conscious awareness. She said, I'm going to drop in the whole thing. Then I had her come, I worked with her on the A, B's and C's. While she's doing the A, B's and C's, or, or cipher the D, A, B, and C is only setting up a program to write and erase, write and erase. When she got down to D, I said, go ahead and write and erase. So she's writing and write the D, G, and how far did you go? G. That's about it. You see, I said, you know, there's a S, R's, and Y's, and P's, and Q's, and D's, and V's, and M's, and N's, and blah, 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 blah. She couldn't stand it. Mental disorientation. She just, I saw her call it quits. So I dropped her in another hole. Every time she, she quits thinking, she gets dropped again, yes? Go ahead, ask her. I was relieved when he said, that's enough. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was getting confused. All right. So I combined them both. Dropped her in a hole twice, three times. I'll show you a few ways, of do, more ways of doing it. So what I kept doing is taking that conscious awareness and kept moving it down, down, less efficient, less efficient, less efficient. Subconscious mind became the boss. Now I have to know, is the subconscious mind the boss? Yes? Um, something just hit me. You're saying that when you're closing our eyes, our cheeks, and our forehead, and all these relaxings, what we're really doing is deepening our subconscious control. We're not deepening the subconscious, we're deepening the conscious. You're conscious. deepening the conscious. conscious. Conscious thinking process and subconscious mind becomes the boss by itself. Okay, so but when you say deepening, you're are you saying it's, yeah, it's okay. deepening. You see, I I always felt that putting a person deeper in a state of hypnosis, you see, to me it's a misnomer. Actually, what you're doing, you're making the subconscious mind the boss. You're bringing it up. What you're doing is pushing the conscious down, because we want to get rid of that consciousness. So what we're doing. We're not altering the state of awareness or changing from one to the other. It's not an altered state of consciousness. I took that one and I pushed it down here. And I'm going to work with something else. I've changed levels of awareness. That's all we did. Yes? I got you stressed, then I give you the release. Yes. And you dropped in a hole. Yes. That's right. Yep. OK. All right. So your job as, as a therapist, you have to take that conscious awareness and get it down here. I always use a progressive relaxation and at least two deepening techniques. This case was counting backwards from 100 and the classroom, the A, B's, and C's. That's what I use. You can use an escalator. You can use an elevator. You can use falling trees. We'll talk about that later on. We'll get to more deepening techniques. You may want to go, we may want to do counting backwards from 100, progressive relaxation, 100. Take them in the classroom. And if you're not ready for it, what we'll do? We'll have you walk out of the classroom into a hallway, and in the hallway is an elevator. Take them to the elevator down to the library. <laughs> so we snuck an elevator in between there, depending upon the kind of person they are. So now what you're doing is bringing this one up here. Yes? How do you know how deep a person is? How, how can you 
We're just getting to it. How do I know that the subconscious mind is the boss? You have to do the testing. You see, I'll tell you what. On the conscious level, you're selective accepting what you intend to use today and tomorrow and every day. The rest of it goes into the junkyard. So on the conscious level, you're selectively accepting what you intend to do. The rest of it all goes in, goes into the junkyard. On the subconscious level, your thinking is entirely different. Everything is automatically accepted unless you decide to reject it. So if I gave her a suggestion that was inappropriate, she could tell me to go jump, get out of the chair, and take off. Her choice, her option, is to reject the suggestion. Acceptance plays no part, acceptance plays no part in hypnosis. You don't have to actively accept, you're stuck with it unless you reject it. So the option is on the rejection. That's it. If the suggestion is not rejected, if you don't exercise your option to say, no, I don't buy it, and you have to have the thought, you have to have the thought. If you don't, whatever goes into that memory bank of yours on a subconscious level is absolutely, absolutely true. So everything not rejected is absolutely true. False statements become true. That's the problem and the solution. 95% of our problems have the origin in unintentional, spontaneous hypnosis. We're exposed to something and we haven't the brains to say no and we just bought it. I says to her, as you sit there, look at your feet, eyes wide open. As you look at the feet, you see it. As you look at the feet, this causes your feet to become glued, stuck to the floor. Touched around the knees, this causes your knees to become locked in position. As the knees locked in position, it causes your legs from your toes to the hips to go numb useless. As the numbness hits your hips, it causes your hips to get heavy, like a big piece of lead stuck in there. As the, hip, the hips get heavy, it causes the arms to go limp. And as the arms go limp, it causes suction cups to jump out from behind the chair, hold you tight. <coughs> and then what did I say? I turned the knife. I said, as you think about getting out of the chair, as you think about getting out of the chair, we'll get into this after a while, your thoughts cause your feet to lock tighter and tighter, knees lock tighter and tighter, I, 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 uh, hind are heavy and heavy, arms limp and useless, suction cuts holding you tight. Compounded the suggestions one on top of the other. If she said no, she said no to the last one, the rest of them are stuck. So I gave her a false statement, and that's the false statement went in there, and she was stuck with it. Because the subconscious mind could only utilize my false statement. It became true for her. So a person is exposed to a negativity, and for that person, if it's entered in in stress, they're locked in with it. So what is the definition of hypnosis? It's a state of awareness. What's the other half? dominated by the subconscious mind. That's all it is. State of awareness dominated by the subconscious mind. That's what it is. Are they in a trance? No, she wasn't in a trance. Did I bypass her thinking process? I didn't do that. Was she highly suggestible? No. I made some statements to her. She never said no, and she stuck. 
The deeper the state of hypnosis, the faster they have to say no. Half a second may be too late. After that time, she stuck with it forever. Unless she works and works and works and works to get rid of it. So understand the consequences of that. A person is exposed to some negative statements and they're stuck with it forever and ever and ever until they come to you and says, I got a problem. You think, okay, began with a thought. Got to figure out where the hell that came from and how we get rid of it. So it's a thinking process we're working with. That's all you got to work with. That person's thought process. And we'll talk about the therapy tomorrow on that. But you have to understand what's all involved here. I told you I'd prove to you that my theory is right. Subconscious mind is the boss and whatever it's exposed to is absolutely true. False statements are true. False statements. I can put a person in hypnosis and I'll say you can't see anything. All these people just disappeared. Nobody here. Can't see anybody. Or I'll say there's a big audience out there and you're the star of the play. And the show is over, and when you open your eyes, you're standing on the stage looking out at your audience, and they're all giving you a big clap. Look at all the beautiful people of the furs and jewelry. Oh my God, nobody there. I did one up in Seattle. I told the nurse that we had the seminar in the Valley Medical Center, the big hospital up there. They gave us the big room to use. And I had the nurse there and hypnotizer. I says, She's a star, and <laughs> she's all everybody else. I says, you need some roses, and I give her the roses. Oh my God, how nice they are, there's nothing there. We took the roses and put them in the corner. I says, every time you come in, I says, those roses continue to grow. By Sunday, the whole roof was covered with roses for her, her alone. <laughs> Nobody else saw the roses. <laughs> Strange. I told her that's what she's going to see. <coughs> see? We'll do some of that after a while here when we get into the therapy show you how strange it works and how things develop that way. But you see what's happening here? Okay. You're born in a state of hypnosis. The subconscious mind is the boss and the conscious mind is down there. Your conscious awareness has not developed cognitive deductive reasoning powers when you're born. So how much time does it take the mother to teach the baby how to feed on the mother's breast. You gotta say, now listen, I'm gonna talk to you now. You put you over here to go, you gotta suck on there, see? You gotta go real hard or something. No, he says, here it is, help yourself. And how long do they keep on feeding themselves? Until they're full. Or until the bucket is empty. <laughs> you see? Your subconscious mind, understand, is there, it's there to keep you alive, to keep you healthy. Trouble is we mess things up. So it's going to feed, subconscious mind says, brain, you run the body. This body needs something, so you have to go and do what's necessary to feed it. So we've got some inborn messages through genetics and DNA programming. The natural thing to keep this body alive, to keep this body growing in a particular fashion, a particular manner. And what the subconscious mind is telling the brain what to do. That brain doesn't do a damn thing until it's told to do something. All right, so what you're doing when the baby is full, stomach is full, something's got to go. 
Who tells the baby to go poo poo? All by itself, it squeezes and gets rid of it. Subconscious mind telling the brain, got to squeeze this out, got to keep this body healthy, got to get rid of it. It takes about eight to eight and a half years to bring that conscious mind up here. So as the child begins to learn and develop cognitive reasoning powers, about eight years, the subconscious mind does what? It starts to surrender control to the conscious part. Now we got a child three years old, got problems. You have to understand that child is in a state of hypnosis. And whatever the parents say to that child, the kid is stuck with. That's right. Can you imagine a three-year-old father says to the little boy, three years old, shame on you. You shouldn't have burned your neighbor's house down. And the kid says, father, you're full of bull. <laughs> Woo, you think you were rolling someplace. You see, the child doesn't know how to think, how to reject a suggestion. Or the child comes home from school, got a report card, not so good. Mother says, well, dad comes home. He's going to have a talk with you about your report card. And the kid sits down and drinks his milk and waits for dad to come home. Calm and collected? No way. Like this. What happened? The kid's in a state of stress and goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And father looks and says, why, you stupid little so-and-so. I'm ashamed of you. What's wrong with you? I had high hopes for you, but you're nothing but a dummy. Tough luck. You're only half as smart as your sister. And for the rest of his life, he's fighting his sister because he's only half as smart. Because what father said is true. Unless someplace in between there, we get some intervening, modulating remarks. Yes? You, you answered Pardon? You, you answered it with that statement. Okay, all right. You see, the last, the last message is the controlling. So you can get all these in there, and then probably later on, they make amends and square things away. But unless they make the amends, and some parents, you know, pretty hard to forgive the children for shortcomings. They're always comparing people with one another and themselves with somebody else. And father's always trying to make the, the son, not always, but in most cases, in his own image. So you have to understand when you're working with children, can you hypnotize a four-year-old kid? You don't have to. He's already there. Isn't that nice? And what do you do? You sit him in a chair, close your eyes, and stay there. You talk to him. How difficult, huh? Be surprised what you get out of it. Now it's getting warm in here. <laughs> At least I am. <laughs> All right. All right, so what we do here is how do we get that conscious awareness down here and bring the subconscious mind up here? Now we got to do the testing. And the testing is giving that person a false statement. And when that false statement is true, then they're ready for therapy. Okay, let's see how many people we have here. Who does the testing? I'm going to ask you what kind of a test you do if you put your hand up. Who tests before they do the therapy? No hands? How do you know they're ready for therapy if you don't do the testing? You're trying to do a therapy when the conscious mind is still the boss. And then you send them home, and you say, well, sorry, you can't be hypnotized. I've always said, if the session, if the session is a failure, you look in the mirror, and that tells you who made the mistake. All right. Uh, 
Dave, we want to pass out that diagram of the brain. It's a one sheet. Okay. All right. I'm going to pass out a diagram of the brain. And this diagram shows how the sens sensitivity of the brain is assigned to the body. Most, more of the brain is assigned to the head and to the arms and the hands. When you relax the hands and so forth, you're shutting down more of the conscious awareness because it's all in there. So I always start with the eyes because I say the eyes are the window to the brain. You shut that down first because that's the input. That's the conscious part. You've got to shut it down. And then I work on the head, the shoulders, and the arms to the fingertips. The rest of the body, if you want, you can skip it. So when you start at the feet, forget it. You wasted all that time in there. There's no sensitivity in the toes by comparison. So you spend your time on the head, the shoulders, arms, and the hands. You'll see on the, with passing out how much of the brain sensitivity is assigned to the hands. They stand that big. The rest of the body is that big. <laughs> That's all it is. And that's why I say you think about and you relax your eyelids and your eye muscles. See how much is assigned? Look how much of that is assigned to the, to the face. Here, let's put this. Let me just hold it for a second. That much is for the hand. That much, half, more than half is for the face. <coughs> And that much is for the rest of the body, hardly any to it. So you do that progressive relaxation, you spend more time on the face and on the head, the shoulders and the hands, and the rest of it you can go zip through it. So what did I ask her to do? I said, you think about, you think about your eyelids and your eye muscles and you relax your eyelids and eye muscles. You think about and you do, you do, not me. You create. You make it happen. I'm going to show you how. I'll tell you where to go. You see how much is there? Makes a big difference. So what you're doing is asking that person to relax. Now, I don't know if you'll notice, but I says relax your eyelids five times. At least five. I started off with think about your eyelids and your eye muscles and you relax your eyelids and your eye muscles. I wasn't satisfied. I said direct your attention to your eyelids and your eye muscles and you make your eyelids comfortably closed and pleasantly closed. And I wasn't satisfied. I said beware of what you're doing and really make those eyelids totally limp and useless. Still wasn't satisfied. I said, concentrate on your eyelids. And you bring upon a sensation that for you is comfortable, pleasant, pleasing, restful, and relaxing. I wasn't satisfied. I said, I'm really mean. Think about your eyelids. And go ahead. You make your eyelids totally limp and completely useless. I've been to conventions and I listen to people. Now your eyelids are relaxing. Now your shoulders are relaxing. Now your arms are limp and rested, and your legs are relaxing, and now you are deep, deep asleep. The guy looks up and says, no, I'm not. He says, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do this progressive relaxation in workshop, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to tell you how to do it. You're going to walk around. I'll tell you ahead of time. You already messed it up. Because I'm going to change your thinking. Never, never, ever use the word will. 
That is a no-no. Nothing will ever happen in hypnosis. You speak in the present tense. Always, always, no matter what you're talking about, must be in the present tense. You use the word will, subconscious mind says, well, we will do this, but you didn't tell us when. Nothing's ever done. If you're going to use the word will, you've got to fix a time, a place, or an event. Tell me. If I asked you to call me tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon, when would you call me? Tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon. When would he call me? He said 12 o'clock noon tomorrow? How about you? When would he call me? Noon tomorrow. When would he call me? Noon tomorrow. When would he call me? Noon tomorrow. He can't call me tomorrow. He can't do anything tomorrow. He'll call me when 12 o'clock noon tomorrow is now. That's when he's going to call me. Because he can only do something at this very moment. Subconscious mind doesn't understand that. It hasn't had the benefit of logical reason. So I'll call you tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon, says, well, never gets here. It's always tomorrow. He'll never call me. He'll call me tomorrow when 12 o'clock noon is tomorrow is now. We only work at this very moment. We can do something 10 seconds from now or 10 seconds ago. It's always now. And you keep that in mind, the present tense. And you don't use the words it, those, or them, should, or would. I says to the young lady sitting up here, I said, you think about your lips and you relax your lips. Relax them? No way. You relax your lips. Make your lips nice and soft and nice and tender. Make your lips wonderful, comfortable, restful and relaxed. So think about your lips. Never use the word it to those or the cheeks. If you're going to use the word it, why use it if, it lips, if it means lips? Repetition and clarity is absolutely necessary. If you ever use a word or a phrase that all of a sudden you think, hey, that could be interpreted, you go right back and explain exactly what you meant. Never leave room for a doubt because if you do, your subconscious mind is going to interpret what you mean in the light of its past circumstances, which may be entirely different than what you had in mind. Yes? I noticed when you had two subjects, sometimes you use words like you might want to do this or you might possibly do this. You left room for some choice. No, I didn't say might. She did. No, I said may. When she was in the classroom and walking down in the library, you said you might want to choose this book or you might possibly want to choose that. Book. Never said that. No? Never said that. When I got her down that aisle, I said exactly what I want her to do. I said slowly and carefully, with your eyes on the right side, slowly and carefully, walk down the aisle, walk halfway and stop. Reach up on the right side, take a book off the shelf and hold this in your hands. I explained to her again what she's holding. Put her on the other side, there's a book up there that has the title of stress. I can't. We can find a cancer book. We're specific. I says to her when I built a picture for her in the classroom, I said, picture and imagine that you're standing in a classroom. And as you stand in the classroom, look around. And you, you just may see the chairs that the students sit in. It might be a combination desk and chair, maybe an armchair, or a plain old chair. I'm building a picture. See? I says, if, let's say with this one, you may have this and this and this and this. Usually these chairs come in rows. All of a sudden, there's a row of chairs. Most classrooms have a teacher's desk. I didn't say there's one here. 
Some classrooms have windows. In other walls, you just may find some posters, pictures, posters. I'm just building a picture. And then there is. There is. And the only thing that is in this classroom is the blackboard or the chalkboard. That's all that's there, for sure. <laughs> what kind of chairs? I don't know. What kind of desk? Where it's located? I don't care. How many windows? Who cares? Where the chalkboard, the blackboard is on the side or the front or the back? I don't care. I build a picture. Most people can't build pictures, so I got to build a picture because I want them to see the chalkboard, the blackboard. All right? That's when I give them options, certain things, building a picture. If I want and if you want somebody to see something specific, distinct, you tell them what they're going to see exactly before you put them in a position to make the observation. No question about it. If you want them to see something specific, you describe in detail exactly what they're going to see before you put them in a position to see it. I did that with her. I said, look around in the classroom, and there is a door that leads from the classroom. When you recognize the door, nod your head, yes, I see the door. So what did I say? The door you're looking at leads to a library. You know what a library looks like. Bookshelves, bookshelves in rows, and lots of books on these bookshelves. All right.